start? Yes. So the floor is yours. Welcome everyone also from my side to this webinar called Very Advanced Systems Engineering with FUS. Today it's part two of the webinar, but no worries. We have a short recap for those who missed part one so that you can enjoy the, this part two anyway. This webinar is done by Tim Walkins and me on behalf of the Functional Architectures Working Group of the German chapter of INCOSI. And when talking about functional architectures, then we can already define what this abbreviation FAS means that we have in our title. FAS stands for Functional Architectures for Systems. Functional Architectures for Systems, we will often say FAS in this webinar for it. So when uh, we look into our title, why is it called Very Advanced Systems Engineering with FAS? So actually this is a joke. We already talked about this in part one. So very short recap again. Uh, well, when it's just systems engineering, it's maybe not specific when we call it advanced. What are we then going to do once we do something more advanced? So we can, we call it very advanced. And then we can, when we do something more advanced, we can then call it extremely advanced. So this way there's an open scale to, to upward. But of course, by calling it advanced, we do not want to insult or offend those of you who are working, working on indeed very advanced methods in systems engineering. That was never the intention when choosing this title. Here is a short recap of excerpts from our CV for those who are watching the video later. Those who are watching live have already uh, heard a, a live introduction of ourselves. So this is why we quickly go over this here and go right into our presentation, which starts with the history of the FAS method, the functional architectures for systems method that we have also presented in part one. So I will go over this very quickly. It's a method that, that started very early, became published for the first time in 2010, which is also our counter for the anniversaries that you see on this slide. Uh, there was very soon an interest around this in the German chapter of INCOSI, so that we founded uh, a, a working group in the German chapter of INCOSI around this. And uh, then you can see of the, uh, on the slide that there's a follow-up publication and uh, during the further maturing of the method and there we are at the present days where we are now going to present you some aspects of this method in this part two of the webinar. A bit about the working group. Uh, this is a working group that is still alive and uh, still uh, meeting uh, regularly under the umbrella of the German chapter of INCOSI and uh, that is also, also hosting some webinars like today. In part one, uh, we have gone more into the theory of the FAST method and some related methods like the, the SUMS method for storyboard activity modeling. In this part two, we promised to do more the practice and the application. Uh, so this is what we're going to do now, uh, but we will of course uh, start with a little recap. Before we go into this, like in part one, a little warning. So like for medication, where medication is helping to remedy the disease it was made for, it is very dangerous to take medication against the wrong disease. And it's the same with systems engineering methods. A systems engineering method applied to the wrong problem can do harm. So we will show methods here, we will show tool implementations here, but it's of course the responsibility of each project that is considering to uh, use a method or a tool to evaluate if the method or tool is actually suitable for the project at hand. And there we start with the recap of part one. So Tim, may I ask you to give us a little recap? Yes, so yeah, a very brief recap. Uh, the first part, as Jesko mentioned, was more theoretical. Uh, and this time we show more the practice. So Jesko, please, next. Yeah, so in the first part, which was a few weeks ago, we discussed, of course, the FAST method in general. And this slide shows, well, FAST in the slide, uh, it basically shows the, the grouping of the use case steps uh, in the top. Uh, that means the, the system functions, and we group them into functional groups from which the functional architecture 
and then be derived. And you see the functional architecture in the lower right corner. Uh, the connections in the functional architecture represent the, the item flows regarding the uh, input and output objects of the functions in the functional blocks. Um, so next, another topic was then first as a formula. Uh, yes, we have shown an exciting approach how to uh, create a functional architecture with metrics operations. And we will also see this in the demo later today. And next, uh, we also presented the so-called SEMS method. And it's a technique for identifying use cases and their steps using storyboards with a graphical facilitator who can draw real cool diagrams, or not diagrams, pictures. And this creative approach brings well innovative ideas into the use case and also supports the identification of um, borderline cases. And here you can see our example system. Uh, it's an aircraft boarding system with uh, yeah, classic elements, such as the approval of passengers and the cabin bench at the top left. Uh, then we have a well protected way to the cabin. And it has also an innovative element, such as the detachable cabin, which speeds up the boarding uh, and other processes on the ground. By the way, this idea seems to be very fictional, but it's not our idea. It's actually uh, being proposed by Airbus. And Tim, the, we get sound interrupts. Sorry, just to mention ah, it. Okay. Um, but I cannot change anything, I, I think. So should I repeat something or is it, uh, can we continue? Should repeat one, two, yeah. A little bit, I think from the SEMS method on going. Okay, so the final slide of the three slides here uh, shows uh, the SEMS method, which we introduced um, uh, in the last part. Uh, it's a technique to identify use cases and steps uh, using storyboards. And with this creative approach, you identify well, innovative use cases and functions, and also borderline cases. Um, and here on the slide, you see also our example, which we will also use here. In this part, it's a boarding system for aircrafts with uh, classical elements like uh, approval of passengers and um, sort of baggage, uh, but also a very innovative, innovative element, the detachable cabin. Uh, you see this uh, at the bottom, the bottom line. Um, but uh, this idea is so our idea it actually came from uh, from Airbus. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the brief recap of part one, and then we can go to the next one. It's uh, the first step into the practice. We also announced it at the last part. It's a car technique for workshops. Um, to do FAS. FAS doesn't have to be implemented with SysML. Uh, it can also be done with a car technique in a workshop with real people <laughs> online, but it also works on site um, or vice versa. It works perfect on site and it can also work online. And, but it can be very helpful, of course, to work together in a team uh, for an initial functional architecture, uh, which can then be transferred to a model after the workshop. Or you can leave it as a list. So we have the, the workshop results, uh, photos of the of the functional architecture that was sketched in the workshop. Um, and you have the, the insights you, you got from the workshop. Uh, the functional architecture is not an end in itself, but it was, was always fulfill um, a purpose. So next, let's have a quick look on this car technique. Uh, it's quite simple and effective. First, you identify the, the use cases and the use case steps and put them on a wall. So next, um, now the use cases and the steps are in separate parts. Uh, the use cases gets the number as well as the steps. Next, um, it makes sense to have different colors, of course. So the top is the use case, and then you have the steps. The number is just for the identification. And it has no further meaning. So the use case has here the number one, and the steps of the use case get one dot and then one, two, three, and so forth and so forth. And in particular, the number has no uh, doesn't specify an, an order. Um, 
we need the number of a traceability when we do the grouping. And we also put the input and output objects uh, of the steps on the card, uh, either on the, on the top and the bottom side, on the left or the right side, uh, where it fits uh, best. And next, well, then we have uh, all these cards on the wall, like also shown in the picture on the top left corner. And now we create the functional groups by rearranging the cards. Um, when we put the cards together that in a single group, now the numbers are important. So we can trace back the individual cards to the use cases. Um, well, and we have the functional groups on the wall in the workshop room or on the virtual board uh, in an online setting. And then we can finally derive the functional architecture from these groups by sketching it in, uh, on a whiteboard. And well, that works very well. We've performed such workshops many times. And at last, well, of course, it depends on the size of the project and the number of people, but it lasts around about one or two days. Yeah, so then the next one. Um, and now we um, heading towards the, the demos uh, and Sysmel V2. Uh, we'll, we'll also have a look on Sysmel V2. So the next one, uh, this table here shows the mapping of our FAS concepts in the left column to the Sysmel V1 and V2 elements. And we won't go into the detail except for one special feature here. Um, in the third row, you see the functional group, which is a FAS concept. And in system LV1, we map this functional group to, to a block. And it's uh, tagged with a zero type functional group. And well, because system LV1 has no usable grouping element, uh, in system LV1, there is an um, element called element group, but it's not very useful in practice. Uh, in system LV2, we map it to, to a package uh, with import relationships to identify the, the membership. Uh, of the functional group. Yeah, and the, on the next slide, we see uh, system where we won and we two in action. At the top, we see the uh, uh, grouping, of, uh, purely conceptual, maybe in a, in a PowerPoint or on the wall in a workshop. Uh, we have two functional groups, IO passenger on the left side with one function and authorization control on the right side with two functions. And in system v one, well, the functional groups are blocks. You see this in the in the middle row of the in the diagram, uh, the column, and the trace relationships to the activities to the right side. And on the left side, we see then the functional blocks, uh, which also have trace relationships to the functional groups. Um, well, we are very used to use diagrams, but uh, you can also perfectly use a matrix, uh, like shown here, to do the grouping. And on the right side, you see the same scenario with system LV2. Uh, we have the functional groups in the middle. Uh, and this time, uh, these are packages. And we have import relationships to, well, in system LV2, it's called actions of activities. And on the left side, we see the functional blocks, which are parts in system LV2. Yeah, and then the next slide. And the next slide, I think, is for me when we get there. Yep. So we are now really approaching the demo. Um, we said last time in part one that the functional architecture can be created automatically. We also showed this matrix equation F equals matrix G times matrix O times the transposed of matrix G, which already shows that there's a clear automatable definition on how to transform the functional groups of use case activities into functional architecture. So this is what we are today going to demo with uh, some implementations. These implementations, we call them fast pl plugin because uh, at least in the system LV1, they used to uh, materialize as plugins of modeling tools. So these uh, implementations, they take use case activities and functional groups as an input. And then they do what Tim showed before we do in a workshop by, by sketching the functional architecture on a flip chart, but now they do it programmatically uh, by using the well-defined procedure that is, for instance, outlined by this matrix equation, and they will uh, output the functional architecture. Uh, for SysML version one, 
as I said, it's a plugin that is integrated into the modeling tool. So here, a little preview of what we are going to get. So we are going to get use cases that are modeled in a modeling tool. We are then calling uh, a transform function of this um, modeling tool plugin. And then what we see on the right-hand side, uh, the, 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 the tooling will then generate, or, or this implementation of the fast plug plugin will then generate a functional architecture model and uh, which we display on the diagram you see on the right. For the system LV2, this is a little different. At least I have not uh, worked with any off the shelf available system L version two modeling tool. Uh, so what we used for the demos that we will show today is the so-called reference implementation. So that is an implementation of a standardized API towards a system LV2 repository uh, that is provided by the SysML2 community. And on top of this reference implementation, we could build a proof of concept pilot implementation of this fast plugin, which we are also going to show you today. So here's a little sketch on how it works via this standardized API implementation. We are going to connect to a repository. And in the middle, you see actually uh, a screenshot of this uh, plugin that we are going to demo. Yeah, here a little summary with links to the plugins implementations that exist. And again, a summary that for SysML v1, it's a dedicated implementation per tool. For version two, it's currently a, a, um, a pilot implementation that is supposed to be uh, tool independent by using the standardized API. And since we already talked about this fuss as a formula approach, uh, currently our pilot implementation supports this approach and then supports also visualizing these matrix calculations. But you will see that soon. Yes, we're going to the demo. Um, I will now take a, 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 a set of uh, paper notes where I've written down how to execute this demo. Uh, you can download these. So we have put them uh, on the internet together with, with the models that uh, that are underlying this demo. So if you're interested in how it worked exactly, uh, you can read all the preconditions and all the tool setup you, we used in this uh, in these uh, presenter notes that we have published online via the link you see on screen. Uh, so let's not keep ourselves busy with the preconditions and directly go into a modeling tool, which I will now do. So you should now all see my modeling tool on screen. And what you see here is the use cases of our example boarding system. So um, these use cases as needed by the FAST method, they are refined into activities. So when I double click here on the get access, then I get all kinds of, of activities and also the very important object flows that are needed to apply the FAST method. When I go back, I can go into another use case. And this use case I wanted to actually quickly show because it's very interesting. This is a use case without human actors. So it has an uh, input of electricity from an electrical supply. It is then kind of conducting current and, and, and transforming it maybe, and then providing the cabin uh, with electricity. So it has input and output to non-human actors. And it's very important when using the FAST method, if you want the complete set of system functions, also the technical ones that have no human actors, that also such use cases, which have purely technical actors are actually modeled. Having said so, let's go uh, to a demo of the functionality. And as you can see, this model, even though it's kind of simple compared to real systems, it's still very complex for someone who wants to make a demo. So I've made a simplified version where you just have the get access use case and you have the supply cabin with electricity. And the first thing that you have here is that the supply cabin with electricity, it's not yet resolved into use case activities. So let's assume I want to refine this now into use case activities because I have not done so yet. Then I want to just demo you a nice functionality of this fast plugin we have here. We could say uh, initialize activity diagrams. And now it has actually created an activity diagram that has already got these partitions that we use for um, uh, placing input and output activities for modeling system input and system output. And it has already associated it them with the corresponding system actors so that I can uh, model input and output uh, to different system actors uh, according to this convention. Why can it do that? 
because when looking at the use case, we see that these two actors are attached to the use case. So it evaluates this information and initializes the right activity diagram. I won't bore you by uh, having you watch me model all this. So let's directly go into some functionality. So let's not look at this use case. Let's look at the, the other use case, the get access one, and let's transform all the things that have been modeled here uh, into functional architecture. Before doing so, this is the simplified uh, use case activities of this model. Uh, those who looked at part one will remember that it looked exactly like this with one exception. And this is this out outgoing flow to the boundary. And this is a flow uh, which happens uh, on, on the boundary of the system. And we will see li later why it's interesting to, to model such flows for the automation with the tool. So let's go and use the tool. So I have already prepared the functional grouping here. This is the matrix that Tim showed before. All the, all the functional grouping has been made. All the um, use case activities have been grouped into functional groups. And that means we have all the preconditions for running this transformation, which I will now do. So I will select this menu option, which is called do all creations at once. I'm presented all the flows that are going to be generated, I will uh, accept them all and say create. And now we see that uh, a lot of things have been created here in the model. And also a diagram has been opened where we see actually the functional architecture that we have been seeing before. So it's exactly the one that belongs to the um, activity model and the functional grouping that we have shown. What we also see that the uh, tool has created a system context. So when I open it, we see actually that it could automatically derive that the system has a connection to the passenger. And this is now actually according uh, because we had before modeled in the IO partition that belongs to the passenger that there's a flow with the outside of the system. And this is how this, is, uh, this tool could, this plugin could automatically derive, sorry, that's the wrong diagram. I wanted to show this one. The plugin could automatically derive that the passenger is connected with the system. And when we now um, display the inerts of the system, uh, then we yes, will- cool. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> this, this was too fast. Um, could you in <clears throat> very briefly explain what is the input for FAST? Well, what has been modeled in Cameo and what Cameo is doing, you don't have to do manually because I guess this is very important. It's uh, the, the value or the feature of, uh, of the FAST plugin, and I'm sorry. And I guess you have to, in a brief words to explain, explain what the plugin is doing for the user, the user doesn't have to do. Yes, so this is the slide I'm showing now. Okay, sorry. Um, and, uh, but it's good that you say that because that was my spare slide in case I can't demo it. So we can use it to, to once more see what has happened. So I showed you, all the things that we have on the left, um, that is the, the use case, which is refined into use case activities, which have been grouped into functional groups. We will then call this function that I called. So this is what you see here. And this is actually the triggers, the implementation of the FAST plugin to generate the functional architecture that we have here. So it has now generated the functional architecture that we have seen. And it has also generated some traces, by the way, between the involved elements. Is that, uh, is, do you think, Chris, this is uh, sufficiently clear now what has happened there on screen? Yeah, I don't have to create a block diagram. I don't have to create manually an uh, internal block diagram. I don't have to create the connectors. I don't have to create the interface definitions. I don't have to create the item flows. Everything is done by the fast plugin. Exactly, exactly. Okay, because I think you know it, but uh, somebody who is watching it would not know it uh, just. Yes, and, and thank you for, for insisting on this. So let's uh, let's go back. So yes, here we see all these automatically created things and I was just going to arrange them a bit more nicely. Uh, yeah, I should once more arrange them. So then you see now that it has created all these things, the connection to the outside world um, and the connection between functional uh, blocks and it looks like here is a connection missing, but this is simply because it has not been automatically displayed. It is there in the model. And when I just tell the tool to display it, then we see that also this connection has been created. So basically 
the full interconnection of functional blocks and the connection to the to the uh, external actors ha have been created by the tool. So that was the demonstration of what we can do with uh, SysML v1. And let's now go into uh, SysML v2. And what you see on screen now is not SysML v2. What you see on screen now is actually open office. So that's the same informal representation that Tim showed before. Uh, this is an informal representation of the same use case activities that we saw before in SysML, grant access, check booking data, check cabin package data. Again, we see an informal representation of the grouping here expressed by these gray shaded fields, IO passenger and authorization control. And why did we not implement any SysML2 uh, way of modeling this? Uh, this is because we expect commercial or other off the shelf tools to, to fill that gap and to allow us to, to model this in SysML2. So we have just made this very prototyped uh, way of providing input in open office, but we can now when pressing this button, we can convert all this uh, to SysML version two. So here you see the so-called textual represent representation of the SysML version two. I could now, if I want to, I could copy it. I could even use this little helper tool, which I have no time to explain in detail, but I, I could uh, use it to actually visualize uh, again, this SysML v2 here. So here you see again, these activities and the and the functional groups, which is the input of the FAST method. So now we have been able to generate the input of the FAST method in SysML v2. And we can now actually store that in our SysML v2 repository. So I will click this button, store FAST input. And now you see that on the right-hand side, we will see uh, database activity in the repository because as it's a prototype, it's a bit slow. So you might believe it's not doing anything, but soon you will see here, you see that now it's writing it to the database. And now it has actually written the input we need for the FAST method to the database. So now I can actually go again to my FAST plugin. So that is the one that will generate all the blocks and all the functional connections. And I can have this fast plugin read from the database, the, the project and everything is already pre-initialized. So I can just click this button and it will run the transformation. It will transform this input that we, that we see in open office and that has been provided in the form of SysML v2. It will transform that to an output, which is the functional architecture again. And when it's done, we will also see that it will visualize this matrix transformation F is equal to matrix G times matrix O times matrix G transposed. Here we have the formula. It visual visualized all that. So you see now the model that you that you saw before, you see it represented in this matrix representation that we had in part one. And you see the output, the functional architecture also in this matrix representation. And here you see the, the functional architecture also in SysML v2 textual representation. And that is exactly what has been written to the repository. So that now with a little other helper function here, we can visualize what is in the repository with a third party block diagram visualizer. And again, warning, this is not SysML v2. This is just generic block diagram style. And then you see again, a representation of the functional architecture that has been generated in SysML version two. Yes, so that was the proof of concept that all this works also in SysML version two. And I want to just make one remark. So as you have seen, we have supported this matrix transformation. We are actually doing symbolic computations with the SymPy symbolic computation uh, package of, of Python. Is that a good idea? Well, I don't know. It's at least here you see how much time it, uh, takes for, for different number of, of input sizes. So I've uh, generated models of different hundreds of use case activities, transformed them. And, and then on the y-axis, you see the time it took to transform them. And it shows that at least for our proof of concept uh, stage, where we probably won't have more than 200 activities, this is performant enough. And it's nice to have this matrix transformation visualized so that one can also understand what the tool does. 
Of course, for a commercial implementation, one would consider like for the SysML v1 solution to make a dedicated implementation that does not do symbolic calculus. The last remark we have now Due to the symbolic calculus, been able to see this grouping matrix G of the fast as a formula approach. And we have before also seen the SysML v1 grouping matrix. And we see that they are quite similar. Uh, and there was a question in part one of the webinar, kind of how are these matrices composed? And then now we could give a very easy answer. Well, at least the grouping matrix is exactly composed as it would be in native SysML v1. Then we come to the sums method. So for the sums method, we have two options. We have a rather quick and dirty option to use this method where, as you remember, we link snippets from storyboards to our use cases. The quick and dirty method is to use a comment box in the modeling tool that we then place over the picture. And that is uh, very nice, very quick, very easy to obtain. Uh, we can also persist what we see here into the repository. The problem is that uh, this associates uh, this uh, image snippet uh, just with an element on a diagram and it, it doesn't associate it with the actual model element of the use case. This can be circumvented uh, with a dedicated um, add-on to the modeling tool, which I'm quickly going to demo. And I'm seeing we have uh, lost a bit of time, so I, I try to catch up here. So I'm going into um, this version or full version of the of the boarding system again, and I'm going into this um, get access use case, and I'm calling my storyboard add-on, or actually it's a it's a free sketch add-on to add a free sketch to my model, um, and I'm going to look for it uh, in my webinar preparation. Yes, here we have the, the passengers coming out, so I'll mark them. This is a German supplied tool, so I here need to click a button in German, which allows me to save it. And now it's associated to this use case here. So when I go to this use case and I say show free sketches, I get it again. So that is another way, a more kind of formal way of, of, of realizing the, the SAMS method implementation. But yes, as discussed here, we have some drawbacks of it because the implementation is again a pilot implementation and not a commercial tool implementation. For the system LV2, we have actually also made the fun to implement it. So here we cannot link to use cases, but we can link to use case activities so far. I can link an image snippet by again calling the same plugin. So I can now, um, choose uh, this image snippet, which belongs to the grant access part, which we have modeled here. And I can again save it. And now I can again store it into the repository. And the interesting thing here is that the SysML v2 will indeed um, will indeed encode this image here uh, as, a, as a base 64 string. And this is actually native SysML v2 that we have the means in the SysML v2 to encode images. And this is why we have full support in the system LV2 for the SAMS method. So once it's saved uh, to the repository, I can again have my little helper tools here show the images. And then you will now it will actually read it again from the repository. And it will show that it can reproduce this mapping between model elements and images. So in the bottom, you see the name of the model element. And here you see the related image snippet. And you can easily verify that it's exactly the snippet that I just wrote to the repository. So just to also show that the sums method is actually well suited for support in system LV2. Or in other words, the system LV2 is actually well support, uh, suited for supporting such methods because it has genuine native support for images. Yes, that was the demo I showed. So this is again my reserve slide. And then just a last demo, and I need to be really quick now <laughs> to make the timing. Let's assume that we have a more complex model and even the full boarding system model is not, a, not as complex as the models we get in reality. In reality, we get far more complex models. And then the question is, how are we going to visualize all the content of the model? 
And what helps us is that the stakeholders usually have a specific concern and they usually want to see only one view on the model. And we have made one example here. So we have a development team that wants to just see from the functional architecture, the functional blocks they are responsible for. And maybe as a second concern, sometimes they want to also see blocks that they're not responsible for, but that they have an interface to. So this is actually supported by a little demonstrator implementation again, where we hard coded these two concerns and the, the so-called eight plugin. So when we go to the airline boarding system example, we could imagine we have an airport related functionality and an airline related functionality in the responsibility of different teams, which want to only see the functional blocks they are responsible for, or maybe according to another concerns, the functional blocks that have interfaces to these blocks. And exactly this we have implemented also um, via this eight plugin, which I'm going to very, very quickly demonstrate. So here in the top left, we have modeled the two teams and we have modeled which blocks they are responsible for. So with a so-called smart package, we have actually grouped the blocks that a certain team is responsible for. And when I now go into this functional architectures that I, I have prepared before this demo, and I create a new uh, SysML internal block diagram, which is completely empty, which I have created now, and I can call it system airline team view, uh, scope. Then I can have my eight plugin, my so-called eight plugin automatically populate this diagram according to these team responsibilities. So I pick the airline team, and it will show, show now exactly the blocks I have modeled, uh, which the airline team is responsible for, and it will show their interconnections. And I, when I now want to know and uh, what blocks are they interfacing to these blocks, then I can call another function of this plugin, which is called auto-populate extended IBD. And then I see that it has now also in green color added blocks that other teams are responsible for, but that have an interface to the blocks in scope. That so far for the very fast demo of this eight plugin. And then I will hand over to Tim uh, for the summary. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, Jesko, for this fast run for all the plugins that were created over the last years. Um, yeah, that was the summary. Uh, next slide. You have the control. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, yeah, a quick summary um, of this webinar. So you saw the, the palm technique for fast, so pencil and paper, uh, also well suited now for developing functional architects. We got this team of much better than uh, do together with modeling tool. Um, well, System LV1 and, and the next generation System LV2 um, offers a very good way to, to record the results of this fast work. And uh, for larger functional models, uh, we need uh, traceability and consistency, which can be maintained very well with modeling tools. And well, the final point is, well, strictly speaking, this is real MBSE. You know, we, we don't just create diagrams that we look at. Um, with modeling tools is that we, we use the possibility that the tools can understand the data, the model information, and can offer us automatisms. No? And uh, the plugins and prototypes that yes has shown are very good examples of what, what is possible there. Yeah, and final slide, yes, go. That's the end. Um, so thank you. And we, we didn't develop this own Jesko and I are standing here on behalf of the FAS working group of the German chapter of Nkosi, uh, which also has many other supporters, like the Technical University of Hamburg, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which provided the sketch plugin, um, the Swiss chapter of Nkosi, and, and so forth. So there are many supporters uh, here um, to create the plugins and the prototypes. Yeah, that's it. So now it's time for questions. Yes, please. <clears throat> and I open the Q&A. have nine uh, questions, 10 open now. 
Same procedure as last time, please mention the first name and read the question. All the participants should read, should be able to see them, but it's better to read it slide. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So the first question comes from BJ Kanal. Um, I hope it's correctly. Um, and he says, I'm working as a systems engineering intern and while doing modeling, I always get confused which information, how much information should show and get confused which diagram I should go with. How can I overcome that? Uh, currently, I'm doing system architecture uh, of functional requirements. Um, well, yeah, I, I hear that you know, the people are a little bit confused. Which diagram should we use? Which information should be on the diagram and so forth? Um, and while there's no easy question, the answer for this, I think the main answer is you must identify the purpose. So you do the modeling and diagrams for, for a specific purpose. The purpose is the driver, what should be in the model and what should be on the diagrams. Um, so you must know the stakeholders of your model and ask them uh, what they would like to see and which information they would like to have. Sometimes you and yourself uh, and, and your team are the, the most important stakeholders and you do this in order to structure your own thoughts. Uh, sometimes the stakeholders are the company processes that require certain documents to be generated from the models and, and so on. I recall the page uh, uh, Jesko showed with the concerns, I guess. The diagram should basically answer the concerns right. of the stakeholder. Exactly. Yeah. So this would yeah. call it purpose, but I we should yeah, call it concern because this is the right term. I guess it was before it one page with two concerns about functionality. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh system L only defines how to show elements and what's allowed in the diagram type. And uh, methods and methodologies like SWOT or FAS, uh, they propose views, but finally, uh, yeah, the concerns are the driver. And if I may add, you know, actually, I also call it purpose when working with people because often, often they are not not used to the term concern because this is systems engineering terminology and our stakeholders, they are often people who hear that for the first time. So I, often when they come and 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 would like to. Uh, yeah, start a modeling endeavor where, where together with the model, we clarify some questions. I ask for the purpose, but I also ask for the scope. And that is um, for, for systems engineers, this is clear that you need system boundaries. You need to, you need to identify your systems. But often when interacting with stakeholders, the, the, the question about the scope uh, sometimes reveals that actually another system is meant or a subset of the system uh, is meant. And that is also very important for the modeling endeavor that you actually model the right system to then comply with the right purpose or concern. Okay, so next question comes from Gurav Mali. And a grouping functions and functional decomposition is different. Which one need to do first level? Um, yeah, it is different. So the grouping is not functional decomposition. Uh, the functional decomposition mainly happens in the use case analysis. Then you identify the use case, which is a kind of a top level function, and then you decompose it in the steps, and so on. Um, by doing this, you must be careful because the, the functions are typically not independent of any objects. Most functions depend on a concrete or logical technical component. Uh, so for example, we have credit card functions like reading the card, authorization, etc. We have only because we have already decided that we would like to have a card reading module. So this card reading module is the owner of the functions. So it's not completely independent of, of the objects. But uh, functional decomposition happens in the use case analysis. And we, uh, in, in fast, we only do the grouping uh, of these functions. Um, next questions come from Markus Nordstrand. Why are the activities in the IO swim lanes? Doesn't the position of the activity in the swim lane mean that the action, that the actor performs the action? So um, yeah, maybe I can maybe I can try to, yeah. to answer this. So 
So I think the question is, uh, what do these activities mean that we have put in special swim lanes, which are labeled IO, and then we, which have also an actor name on them? And it's actually a very good question. And thank you for asking that, because I think we need to clarify that. And maybe I can find the slide even where, do we have a slide where we show that? Or was it only in the tool? Yeah, maybe it's only in the tool that we had it. So so never mind, but, uh, but these, um, can actually go to the tool, right? I have it open. So let's let's take the time and find a good example. So the question was, uh, this is a more complicated one, doesn't matter. The question does, what does it mean when you have such an IO swim lane that is actually labeled with a certain actor? So here you had the ones that, that we talked about. You have the, the passenger and then you have, have here the grant access. That is the example we had. So what does it mean? It means actually that grant access is a function of the system. All the activities we are modeling here uh, they, and all, that are called here by call behavior actions to be completely correct, they are functions of the system. And that we place them in an IO partition, that is a, a good habit that we established with the FAST method that we can separate functionality that is pure system input output from the core functionality of the system. And that we now even assign an actor to this partition is a hint for the tool that the input output, and maybe also for the human reader, but mainly for the tool that the input output goes to the passenger or comes from the passenger. And this is important information in this automation where we later on show actually object flows with actors outside the system boundaries. So we need to somehow identify uh, which actor outside the system boundary is actually targeted by a certain function like the ground access. But it's very important to remember that all these functions we show here, they are functions inside the system. Uh -huh. Uh, next question is from Matthew Gibbs. What is the relationship between the functional block and the use cases? Um, well, there's no direct relationship between functional block and use cases. The relationship between the, the functional architecture stuff and the use case world is mainly the relationship between the functional group and the use case activities. It's a trace relationship from the functional group to an activity. And the activity has a relationship then to the use case. Either it is uh, directly owned by the use case or it is uh, used by the use case. So it's uh, at a more detailed level. So that's the relationship between functional architecture stuff and, and the use cases. Um, yeah, let's go shows the slide where you see the relationships. Then Christopher Lane asked, uh, what does the activity partition without a name represent? What is its role in the transformation? So maybe over this to, to his phone because he already answered. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, let's go to the let's go to the diagram that this question relates to. So I need to find it back. So here we have actually the example from uh, our demo where we have one activity partition that we now already covered. That is an IO partition and we can have multiple ones for them. One per actor that we have input output with. And we said, this is the input output functions of the system. The activity partition without any relationship to an actor and without any stereotype, that is the partition that takes the core functionality of the system. So that is functionality where the system does what it is supposed to do and processes things, objects, matter, information that uh, need to be processed in order for then again, kind of being able to generate the desired input or output uh, with actors. Yep. Um, next question comes from Julia Jose. Is the conversion to SysLV2 available only with OpenOffice? So yes. Uh Yes, um, it's uh, also available with LibreOffice, but I don't think that this was a question. Um, it's indeed, I mean, it's really a quick and dirty implementation we made in, in, in OpenOffice or LibreOffice. So this one, 
where we where we have this convention that the the dashed lines they they are functional groups and the 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 uh, shapes with solid lines they are functions or, or activities in the uh, use case activities in the in the terminology of the fast method um, that was a quick and dirty implementation available indeed only for open office or libre office and as i said we hope that soon there will be off the shelf susmlv2 tools that will allow us to throw away all this implementation and, and and to focus on on our core business which is to provide support for the fast method uh, anton asked uh, thinking of verification of a system generated by the fast method since we start with use cases it would be hard to trace back to the requirements is there something in the fast method that takes verification of the system into account <laughs> Uh, maybe I can answer the part of the traceability back to the requirements. Um, well, it depends how you define your functional requirements. Uh, so in some approaches, the, the use case or the, the activities behind the use case itself are also functional requirements. So the, the, we use the same model element for the activity stuff and for the requirements. So then we have a direct traceability. If not, uh, then I, I would always propose that there is a relationship from the use cases or the use case activities uh, to the functional requirements, which are maybe also in the system model or also in the system model, but at least we, we need a traceability. So there should be a traceability uh, back to the requirements in any case. And I don't know, yes, we're going to hand over you the question about the verification. Yes. So, uh, yeah, and and I think it's a very broad question to ask whether the FAST method uh, takes verification into account. So I have at least two answers. So when we talk about the tracing of a verification artifact, like a test case to the artifacts on of the FAST method, then it would be indeed tracing them to use cases, right? There's use case based testing, and then we could trace a test case to a use case, which is an input artifact of the FAST method. If you are obliged for or, or, or willing to rather trace to to, to requirements, then, then you could do what Tim has said. You could trace your use cases to functional requirements and trace your your verification to the functional requirements. That was the one answer. Another aspect of the verification is of course the design for verification, or you could say the architecture for verification. So why not the functional architecture for verification? Sometimes we need to foresee system functions that are there just for the sake of verification, like loggers or like special access interfaces via which we can extract information for the sake of verification. And this is, of course, also functionality that one could model. So one could actually model verification actors and their use cases towards the system and then derive the, the functions that are that are only implemented during a design for verification activity. That would be my second part of the answer. Okay, next question comes from Pascal Vollmer. In your formula, what is the meaning of F, G, and O? Yes, go. Cool. Yes, and that was uh, what we had in part one. So I will very quickly reiterate it. And otherwise, you can you can watch the YouTube video of, of part one. There we explain it in full length. So F is a matrix representing the functional architecture. O is a matrix representing the object flows in between the use case activities. And G is this grouping matrix where we group um, the uh, use case activities uh, into functional groups. And then the notion is that in this F and O matrix, we, we, uh, we model flows by actually um, having the, the matrices uh, represent the flow. So when it says cabin baggage requirements here, then this means, this is the, the, the object flow matrix, then this means that the cabin baggage requirements go from my second use case activity, um, sorry, go from, from my first use case activity because it's in the first row to my second use case activity because it's in the second row and uh, in the second column, sorry. So from the first use case activity because it's in the first row to the second use case activity because it's in the second column. Um, this is a convention we have for these flow matrices with the rows and the columns. Um, so, uh, and then you can ask yourself, what is the first and the second use case activity? And we have just ordered them by the alphabet. And the same goes for this functional architecture matrix F. 
So this functional architecture matrix F there, you have the same convention, what is flowing from where to where, but here uh, again, we write the flows between functional blocks into the matrix. And here you can also see there's a plus sign. And this simply means that you have two flows flowing in, in, in the same place uh, between the same blocks. Okay, so the next question is from Anton. Uh, the graphical diagram approach may look nice to people, but it would be hard to integrate with tools such as code generators and mode analysis tools. Uh, System v 2 might be a good direction to help in this direction. Do you consider a pure textual approach with fuzz relies on System v 2 um, Well, System v 2 has a textual notation, a complete textual notation, so you can Ignore the graphical stuff if you like. Uh, you must stop, but you can. Uh, and yeah, yes, to show that we can do fast uh, with, with textual notation. Uh, the first, okay, the first step was he, he showed the diagram in, in Open Office, but then he created the system LV2 textual notation from it. If we use this information, this fast for formula approach to create the uh, the functional architecture, also in textual notation. And finally, for the presentation, uh, yes, we created again a block diagram. Um, so the, the core part is pure textual. Yes, you can do it completely textual. If I may add, you know, one could ask themselves if there is a, a real case for for doing code generation in, in this context, because I see, let's say, most uses of the FAS method in a, in a context where an en engineering team needs to develop a common understanding. And it can actually be sufficient to do this workshop technique that, that Tim showed to reach that common understanding and then you're done. And then you're of course far away from code generation. But even if you then decide to say, okay, this, is, uh, this was so value adding what we created together that we want to maintain it further in a modeling tool and maybe interlink it with the rest of our system model. I think still we need to consider that it's a, a representation whose value is in, in the creation of a common understanding. And then I'm not sure if if it's uh, goal seeking to then generate code from something that should create a common understanding. Our next question comes from Harald. What happens once the plugin has automatically generated the functional architecture? Uh, is in your idea the work now done, or does the actual functional design starts now, meaning the plugin only generates the starting point? It's a good question. But technically, um, we cannot generate a functional architecture in an existing functional architecture. So we can, cannot do the merge. Theoretically, it's possible, but our plugin does not support that. Um, so it, as soon as we start to refine the functional architecture that was generated, uh, we cannot do the generation process again without losing, uh, overwriting the functional architecture again. Um, so in that case, it's only a starting point, but it's, um, but it's of course, it always depends on how you do your project, but usually it's it's uh, step with the uh, most effort. But if you have all of these use case activities in a real project, you have hundreds of them, then to generate the functional architecture in the first step. But then you must really maintain it. Tim, we are running late. <clears throat> Let's pick one last question. I think the one from Daniel is interesting. <clears throat> from Daniel, second one. Uh, from your perspective, what are the bounds? and interfaces between a functional architecture and a logical architecture. Is functional architecture a way of doing logical architecture or supplement to it? And that's a very good question. Um, well, uh, usually the way is uh, you have the functional architecture and then you allocate the functional architecture to a logical architecture or physical architecture or whatever you call, call that one. Uh, so that's an allocation relationship. Um, and I know two approaches in projects. So some people uh, do use case analysis stuff and they do the functional architecture and then they create the physical architecture, so the logical architecture stuff, and then they continue uh, with all the iterations in between. And some uh, go straight forward, use case analysis uh, in the physical architecture, logical architecture is one stream, and the functional architecture is only one, it's, it's an add on, sometimes only to get some insights. So it's, or throwaway architecture. I do this from time to time to get insights and throw it away. Or I do the functional architecture and uh, do this application also to the physical architecture as, as a second 
uh, way from requirements to the physical architecture. So yes, do you have something to add? No, I I don't think. Uh... Okay. Okay. So well, now we we run out of time for more questions. Then, but we are already after the hour. So thanks. Maybe a quick one. I see the last one. Can the eight plugin independently use from the fast plugin? Yes, these are two different plugins. So thank you for a great talk and thank you audience for your questions and your time. Um, yeah, thank you for attending. We hope you enjoyed this talk. Good luck and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you.